Good afternoon, let's introduce. Uh, my name is uh, Techno Kim from Roche. Well, a lot of new drugs are being developed, and IC8 guideline is to support those new drug development to be more efficient and to be uh, uh, provided to the patients more quickly so that it provides the guideline to control and manage quality, safety, and efficacy of the investigational product, or IP. So today, I'd like to talk about Twenty sixteen announced ICH E six R two guideline, which is more systematic and prioritized risk based approach principles apply. So I'd like to talk about that today. So this is the agenda of the day. I uh, last year, November. There was a big revision to ICH E6 R3. The, during the time, there was only concept paper, however, with a big revision. The background of the big uh, revision and the implementation plan were discussed in the concept paper, so I will go over that. And in R2 and R3, both of them emphasize the risk-based management, or RBM. So I will talk about that too. And also, I will focus on the Section 5.0.4 risk control and Section 5.0.7 risk reporting will be more discussed. And particularly, I will talk more about the quality tolerance limit. The terminologies and processes and cases for the QTL will be discussed. So this is the very first version of the ICH E6 guideline, which was first released in 1996. That uh, was focusing on monitoring, reporting, and archiving an essential document in IB. After 20 years from that, the second version with the revision came out. There was uh, E6R2 that was in 2016. And after that revision, many companies and CROs are trying to implement it. And last year, however, another big revision was released. So new R3 will be effective in 2021. So, what's the background of the recent revision? And that is stated in the concept paper. The first reason is the environmental change. There are many new technologies that impact on the study designs. For example, adaptive trail design, phase one, in phase two, these phases can be seamless phase one and phase two trials. Or from the very early days, safety and efficacy can be the standard for dropping out a certain arms or Sample size can be adjusted, so that kind of the adaptations can be done during the tr trial. That's the adaptive trial design. So decentralized and virtual trials are another one. The remote patient solutions or remote monitoring solutions are provided. So the study design is uh, centralized. So examples can be uh, telemedicine, bring your own device, or remote source data, or consent forms. They're already in practice. So these are available now, so it's a more decentralized and virtual trials. 
And other than that, the pragmatic trial design is about real-life routine practice conditions. So it shows the impact of the intervention in real-life routine practice condition. And prospective and retrospective RWD or RWE type of study designs are increasing too. So these are the new technologies or the environmental changes behind R3. There are uh, three components in R3. First of all, the body that replaces R2 of working principles and objectives. And traditional interventional uh, clinical trials is well defined in Annex 1. That's the second part. And the third part is the new part. The new clinical trials that I just mentioned, like a pragmatic clinical trial or decentralized clinical trials and other non-interventional clinical trials are well defined in Annex 2. So these new technologies and new concept of the clinical trials were well defined here in this revision. So many of the principles of the GMP or GCP were introduced here. And I will talk about that later in more detail. So uh, based on the concept ba paper of R3, the basic guidelines and the concepts of the R2 were maintained in here, and some of them are modified and reorganized. And there is a there was a gap between the guideline and the practice, and the kind of the gap and inconsistencies were identified and embraced, and that's the goal of the R3. So of the components of R2, I will focus on the RBM, risk-based management. And before I talk about it, I want to talk about why and how the R2 was revised in 20 years. The thing is that the internet and the smartphones are widely used. So now the CRAs can do decentralized SDV now. So e-source data are plenty. And because of this kind of a changes, in order to maintain the quality, established process need to be uh, given. So the computerized system, validation, quality management system, tolerance limit, quality report. So all these areas need to be well structured. And this requires quality by design, quality risk management, the concepts from the GMP to be adapted to the GCP environment. So clinical trial, design, conduct, oversight, recording, and reporting uh, throughout all the process, these kind of a concepts from the GMP were introduced. So the keyword of the R2 would be three. One is technology, and second is risk-based management and uh, monitoring, and three is oversight. So when it comes to the introduction of new technologies, people need to be skilled so that they can monitor the data, a lot of data centrally. And the quality of data need to be rep uh, reproducible and should be maintained even after 10 years or 20 years. And risk-based management but 
um, allow us to identify and handle and control the signals for risk. So the uh, risk plan need to be set at the study level. And tolerance limit for decision making should be established at early stage. And monitoring oversight and inspection should be done based on that uh, limit. And for the investigators, institutions, sponsor, and CRO, and their oversight, oversight over them is important. So this is the quality by design from GMP and how it is adopted to G uh, GCP. This is from 2020, the paper released in 2020. Safety and clinical outcome and reliability of that. The critical data that can impact on those things. The critical quality factors are identified from those data and what kind of risk are there. They should be uh, identified and the control strategy need to be set. Key risk indicator and quality tolerance in the, uh, limits need to be monitored at the study level. And if there is any deviation, uh, there should they, there should be followed by actions, and that should be uh, well documented in this uh, report. Risk-based approach. When it comes to the risk-based approach, there are seven key steps. The critical process and data identification and risk identification and risk evaluation and risk control and and the mitigation of the risk need to be communicated, reviewed and reported. And of that I will focus on risk control and risk reporting. Section 5.0.4 and 5.0.7 are related to this. So let's look at the section 5.0.4. Use and or which risk to accept. The approach used to reduce risk to an acceptable level should be proportionated to the significance of the risk. Predefined quality tolerance limits should be established, taking into consideration the medical and statistical characteristics of the variables as well as the statistical design of the trial. To identify the systematic issues that can impact the subject safety or reliability of a trial result, detection of a deviation from the predefined quality tolerance limit should trigger an evaluation to determine if action is needed. Uh, next is the section 5.0.7. Approach implemented in the trial and summarized important deviation from the predefined quality tolerance limit and remedial actions taken in the clinical trial report. 자, 지금 제가 읽어 드린 어 5.0.4와 So as I just read section uh, 5.0.7 and 4 defines uh, the risk reporting and risk control. So when it comes to the parameters 
at the study level, study or trial variables are called as parameter of the variables, patient's safety or the out the reliability of the clinical study outcomes can be impacted by some trial variables and key risk indicators point out or identify uh, those variables. So the KRI or the key risk indicators need to be identifiable and monitorable. And there should be some measures to manage them. I will talk about it more with the systemic error later on. And when it comes to the threshold, um, this is the level to detect potential issues. And of the parameters, if that is more related to the quality and important for the quality, that is called as the quality tolerance limit. So when it comes to the quality tolerance limit, it is related to the participant's safety or reliability of trial results and a systematic issue that could impact such safety and reliability. And if there is any uh, devi uh, deviation occurs, it means it goes over the QTL. At the setting up of the uh, study, QTL need to be defined at least no later than the uh, FPFV. And that should be stated in the uh, protocol. As you can see on the uh, slide, there is an upper QTL and lower QTL. There is a normal distribution depending on the study design and depending on the parameter and the impact. We can go for single side or both sides. Usually, the secondary limit is adopted at many companies. It's not mandatory to report on the secondary limit. However, when we use the secondary limit, it's better to manage the risk. It's more efficient. And if there is a breach on the secondary limit, It shows the potential of the systemic error. In order to address that issue, some actions need to be taken and that should be assessed. Upper QTL, if it is not abide by or broken, then why it happens? And whether there should be some actions taken at this moment or the actions can be taken later on after the uh, clinical trial is over. That kind of devaluation need to be done. That is stated in the section 5.0.4. There are error risks that can be categorized into systemic error and random errors, but we need to differentiate them. When it comes to the systemic errors, I will explain it later on one more time, but it means that there is a reason for error, and that's why the error occur. The participant's safety can be impacted by this error, and this can be mitigated. For example, there is a protocol deviation AE or inclusion exclusion criteria related data variable lost to follow up would be the examples for that. For the systemic error, you can see from picture on the slide, this is called as the PDSA cycle. Uh, this is used in the GMP landscape, plan, do, study, and act, PDSA. So in GCP environment, for plan, we define QTL. And it should be monitored at the do step. 
And let's say if there is an excursion occur, then root cause analysis need to be done at the study level and at the act level, the feedback into process will be given. So as we go over this cycle again and again, as time goes on, the quality will just uh, improve. So as I said, systemic error has the reason for that, source variability. And also, historical data need to be well reviewed for a systemic error in order to identify the systemic error. And before that, I'd like to talk about the random error. You can take it as a noise within the systemic error, meaning that this is something we can, uh, we cannot do anything. Human body is heterogeneous. Because we are heterogeneous, there are different reactions like safety profile. We just cannot make any adjustment or control to it. So that are called random error. This is something we just ha have to accept. Next, what are the examples of QTL? The most most commonly used QTLs are listed here, the major three. This was an excerpt from Pfizer's previous presentation. Inclusion and exclusion criteria in protocol, patients outside that range um, get enrolled or dropped out for some reason um, patients are dropped out or the percentage of the patients um, lost so when there are e uh, errors with this primary endpoint and the overall uh, study systems quality can be questioned so these risks must be able to be controlled for dropout and lost follow-up. It underpowers study and it creates a noise in the interpretation of the study results. So those are risks. How do we define QTL? This is a diagram of explaining that process. Quality tolerance limit are separated into three stages. Stage setup, stage conduct, and stage close out. At each stage, different components targeting different outcomes. In the study setup phase, Clinical risk lead biostat DMQ A C S C O R A M A and other parties concerned and available resources are used to select QTL from quality list as an outcome. Study management plan um, is derived. How uh, did the monitoring, um, how was the monitoring done and how the follow-up was done? These must be included in the documentation. In study close out reporting, medical writer and CSR reviewers based upon this documentation reviews and um, provides their opinions. Deviation of QTL, action, and conclusion are described here. Let's get into more details uh, for each stage. At the study setup level, within study management plan, like I explained earlier, many experts um, need to communicate medical and statistical division must be actively involved their expertise and knowledge must be utilized in case 
uh, there was a similar study in the past um, with QTL and statist statistical information could be used for repetitive simulation to set important and critical numbers um, numbering. For example, dropout. For dropout, based upon the total enrolled patient numbers, it is divided by the dropped out the number of dropped out patients or depending on the study design or therapeutic area um, we could approach from different perspective let's say there are 2000 patients and they have to visit five times in the early stage after the first visit the dropout rate and then the dropout rate after the fourth visit patients who are enrolled didn't receive any treatment and dropped out. So there could be different cases, all these different cases. On patient safety and the result of the study could have big impact. So a simple calculation of dropout rate by um, number of patient is not enough. For example, the dropout rate uh, per 1,000 visit may be needed. Normalization is required uh, in certain studies and the biostat team and other medical experts must be involved in the discussion. Usually three to five QTLs must be selected according to the recommendation. If it's too many, there could be a distraction and that could um, create side effects. For certain parameters, it could have an impact on the outpatient trial. Let me take an example. Depending on the therapeutic area, significance of parameter varies. Lost follow-up, for example, for anti antiviral, it's important, but for rare disease study design, it's relatively less important. So in QLT, which parameter will be used and what kind of definition will we use? What would be the unit that we uh, select? And the histological data and literature searching uh, must be done to come up with specification. Do we want to go for lower or uh, um, upper or both for tolerance limit? And what is the justification for that selection? These must be included in Q in the defining QTL. Next, the second phase, study conduct, where monitoring is done. Monitoring includes for how long or how, uh, what is the frequency of the monitoring. The details must be there when there is a breach. Root cause analysis must be done. and which follow-up actions are required and carried out. That must be included as well. These will be reflected to CSR, frequency, monitoring period, total period, and exceeding time, root cause and analysis, QIT adjustment. If that happened, what is the rationale and the results? These must be explained. So far, um, it was a theoretical explanation. Let's get more practical. Let's uh, take a look at the actual case. This case has a critical um, data at primary endpoint at week 52. Risk indicator is subject dropout. Things to consider. Is it possible um, that this dropout is a safety signal? Is there any lack of sufficient data for statistical analysis? And could that lead to primary endpoint failure? 
these are the questions to be asked. As for parameter, percentage of subjects with a premature um, disc from discontinuation from study. QTL, 35%. The base for that is that many experts and historic literature database and historical study design showed that the dropout was around 35%. With different parameters, we do the simulation. And within 35% is OK, but if it exceeds 35%, statistically, uh, there could be um, issue with statistical interpretation. So the threshold was set at 35%. If we observe this from the very beginning, within the uh, initial week, the total number is too small, so it could lead to wrong interpretation. So monitoring begins at week 12. QTL, 35%. Monitoring begins at week 12. Graph to your left is the result. In the beginning, dropout rate, as we anticipated, was pretty high. And from week 12, it gets stabilized. As time goes, dropout rate steadily increased. Week 50 to 56, 35 percent, and 64, 39 percent. Now, why a sudden increase of dropout from week 56 to week 64? What is the reason? Root cause analysis is done. The screening procedure of the particular site is investigated to see whether there are any problems. Or comparison with other sites to come up with a conclusion whether there is a safety signal at week 56, 35 per percent, no impact. Whether there is a lack of statistical um, numbers, no. Potential failure of the primary objective, no. So the report includes that this deviation was caused by an increase in the number of loads to follow up in the final eight weeks of the subject treatment phase resulting in an increased level of discontinuation discontinu rate. There was no impact on the patient safety, so the study continued. This is my um, takeaway message. I've talked about different things today. In 2016, ICHE6R2 included innovative technology and innovative design, new principles from GMP was integrated, risk-based management is introduced, oversight of parties concerned were emphasized, risk-based management, QTL implementation, is a risk control tool to find systematic issues from study setup phase based on consultation with experts, time frame, frequency, and more details must be included in the planning phase during the study conduct period. 
cause analysis, root cause analysis, and important deviation and actions must be documented and must be uh, included in CSR. Last but not least, in 2021, big revision is expected. All of the pharmaceutical companies need to start preparing for this new change. To maintain quality, fact-driven risk planning and evaluation and control has been doing that work has been a big challenge. It re remains as a homework for 40 to 45 minutes. The ICH guidelines been introduced. This is a very fundamental principle. Each uh, organization and companies uh, based upon their business scope and study design resources and capability must find a way to establish uh, the system so that you all of you could have a successful de um, clinical development. Thank you very much for your interest. So with that, I'd like to close my presentation. Thank you for your attention.